showing them that we can provision an environment zero to everything in 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, I don't mind keeping you from your coffee. I'm glad I'm not keeping you from beer like, yet. Um, so James asked me to speak specifically on this topic. Um, I had some people ask me why I wasn't talking about World of Warcraft at a conference on craft, but this will be better. I promise that as well. So my topic today, Middle Earth, homebrew of the century. It's a question. I'm not going to make that argument just yet, but I'll throw it back at you at the end of my talk. Um, but a little bit about myself first. I work at a company called Apprenda. You'll see them listed as one of the Monkey Grass sponsors. I'm a technical writer there. Um, they were very, very nice to send me across an ocean to talk to you today. So I'm very, very grateful for them to sending me there, or for sending me here. Um, but also, I'm the assistant director at the Writing Center at the University of Albany, where I just, as in a month ago, completed my doctorate in English. <laughs> And James was kind enough to put Dr. Kelly up on the speaker's list, which made, my, was the first time I got to use that in public, so I was very, very happy. Um, my dissertation is on medievalism, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but some of you may also know me, incidentally, as the Dungeons and Dragons girl, if you were at Monktoberfest. Dungeons and Dragons was, played a big part in my talk, um, and I got that nickname for some reason, so I was like, People would walk up to me at the beer dinner and be like, oh, you're the Dungeons and Dragons girl. I'm like, yeah, as opposed to the other red-headed woman who was talking at Monktober Vest. Um, but I'm happy to have that name. Um, and was very, very pleased to see the talk that you just heard, yeah, where we got Dungeons and Dragons and Star Wars to boot. Um, so when I began my talk at Monktoberfest, I started with a question, and it was the same question that Anna and Liz threw out, was you know, who, who has played Dungeons and Dragons? Um, and in that room, every hand in the air shot up, um, which I don't know if maybe Dungeons and Dragons is not as popular here, or if people are just not as willing to admit that they played it. But I'm gonna start with a different question for you today. Who here has read or seen The Lord of the Rings? All right. Thank you for not holding back on that one. Um, now I know I don't have to do any plot summaries or anything like that. Um, so the Lord of the Rings is going to play a, a big part um, in my talk today, more specifically Middle Earth, the world that J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the Lord of the Rings, the Silmarillion, and the Hobbit um, created. Tolkien, in addition to writing, you know, or while creating, or while writing Lord of the Rings, um, created his own version of Middle Earth. He created Hobbits, Ents. He created a number of languages, which I will talk specifically about today. Um, and he actually started the mass market fantasy genre as we know it. It's very difficult to kind of think of a world where you couldn't just be a George R. R. Martin. You couldn't, like, as a small child, be like, I want to grow up and write fantasy novels as a living. But things were not like that when J.R.R. Tolkien was growing up. There was no, I'm going to be a fantasy author dream that he could have when he was a child. Um, in addition to all of these things that he created, he's adapted a number of things. Um, one of them, taverns. Um, this which is no big surprise, being that he did a lot of his writing, uh, or a lot of his discussions of his writing, at the Eagle and Child in Oxford, also known as the Bird and the Baby, where he met with a number of his colleagues at Oxford who were together known as the Inklings. Many of you probably already know this already. Um, but I bring it up simply because I think that beer and writing and good thinking should always go together. So Token and I agree on that. Um, so my talk today is kind of a riff on a book, a 2000 book written by Tom Shippey, who's a very, very well-known tokenist um, in the field of English studies, called J.R.R. Token, Author of the Century. Now in this book, he's not necessarily positing that Token is the author of the century, although you can make that argument. Um, he is saying that he is an author of the century, meaning that his works are a result of the events of the 20th century, and that the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, the Silmarillion, they wouldn't have happened without Tolkien being from the time and place that he was. Um, so when I'm asking if Middle Earth is Middle Earth homebrew of the century, 
I'm kind of ripping off him, that, that this is a homebrew, it is a side project that is a direct result of his experiences um, as a, a citizen of the 20th century, and specifically the early 20th century. Now, Token was not a professional author. Um, it was his side job. Token was a professional medievalist. And by medievalist, I'm talking about a professional scholar of medieval studies. By medieval studies, I'm talking about um, the institutionally constituted field of study that takes as its subject the Middle Ages, and it's often interdisciplinary. Um, you don't find many medievalists who only know about English or only know about art or only know about music or history. They tend to, you tend to have to have some type of knowledge of all of those. Um, and Tolkien certainly lived in that kind of interdisciplinary world, even though he belonged basically to an English part, department. He was the Bosworth and Rawlinson Professor of Anglo-Saxon, which is Old English, at Oxford. Um, just to kind of cover my terms, when I talk about medieval, I'm using the adjectival form of the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages itself is a very contentious word. Um, I am at great danger of being criticized from any medievalists who happen to be out in the audience. Are there any? Darn. Um, I'm safe. Uh, a period in usually European history, roughly from 500 to 1500. Um, and this gets back to what I study and what I wrote a dissertation on, which is medievalism. That's my probably, aside from token, my favorite form of medievalism, Monty Python, um, which is interpretations and appropriations of the Middle Ages from post-Middle Ages, or post-medieval eras. Uh, and you can even make the argument that there are forms of medievalism that are happening during the Middle Ages themselves. For instance, Arthurian legend, um, which you see kind of reiterating itself throughout the Middle Ages, is often seen as a form of bringing back ideas from an earlier age and kind of reinterpreting them. So back to token. My, my kind of idea of him as in, in his uh, creation of Middle Earth as being a homebrew specific to his time and place has a lot to do with the fact that he is the heir of both 19th century medieval studies and 19th century medievalism. I'm gonna start with medievalism because it's a lot more fun and there are better pictures. Uh, so medievalism, which you, again, you can kind of date back to even before the Middle Ages ended, became very popular in the 19th century, especially in Britain. And there's this kind of phenomena that we tend to call the medieval um, 19th century British medieval revival. Uh, the picture you see is a painting by William Morris, uh, 1858. His kind of, it, sometimes it's called Queen Guinevere, sometimes it's La Belle is all, it's an Arthurian theme, um, but it's kind of a very good kind of snapshot of the types of things that were going on. But in addition to painting, there was medievalism in poetry, novels, architecture, and even home decor, which William Morris played a big part in. Um, if you're kind of familiar with William Morris, it might be because of William Morris and Company. So if you're associating something like this design with William Morris, it's because that's the same William Morris. Um, he had a design company. Um, he had this idea that you could take medieval design and medieval craft techniques and kind of bring them back and that would somehow uh, counteract industrialism and, capital and capitalism and things like that. Uh, so he kind of had that going on. Kind of as his side project, he wrote some fantasy novels. And he actually wrote what is often considered the first fantasy novels in English. Um, and the two that are listed up here, The House of the Wolfings and The Roots of the Mountains, are seen as these kind of semi-historical novels that are kind of grounded in fantasy. Um, these were very important for Token, he read them. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but you'll see names and ideas in here that if you were to read William Morris and you were to read Token, you would see them kind of like spring up. Names like Gandalf and Mirkwood and the Dale, right? So if you ever have a free couple hours, pick up some William Morris and you'll be like, if you did not know that William Morris came before Token, you would think that he was ripping off Token, but he's not. In addition to writing fantasy novels, um, Morris went to Iceland, and he translated, um, uh, he translated, uh, uh, pardon me, I had a little bit too much beer when I found out that I wasn't speaking, <laughs> and now that I am speaking, it's coming back to bite me. Um, but he translated uh, Icelandic saga, and, and one of his kind of more important translations is a translation of the Volsanga saga that he did in 1870. Um, he later adapted that into poetry. So his initial translation was in prose. He then kind of translated it into poetry. Um, and it was then condensed into this kind of very short version by Andrew Lang in the Red Fairy book 
which is one of Andrew Lang's big collections of fairy tales. You have the Red Fairy Book, the Blue Fairy Book, etc. This was published in 1890. This is very important. We know that Token read the version of the Volsanga saga that was in there, um, because in, in a uh, letter to Auden um, from the 1950s, he talks about how his first introduction, um, or the first thing that he ever tried to write was a story about a dragon, and that he had, he had based it off of this translation of the Volsanga saga that he had read in Andrew, um, in Andrew Lang's Red Fairy book, based on William Morris. Um, Morris also translated Beowulf. And some of you are looking at me like, no, we're not going to talk about Beowulf. We are, <laughs> but not a lot. Um, so, so he translates Beowulf. Um, it's, we know that Tolkien read Morris's translation of Beowulf because he kind of critiqued it a little bit. He didn't like some of his word, his word choices. Um, and Tolkien, of course, went and did his own translation of Beowulf, which some of you, it only came out recently, so some of you may have, have seen this as something that is now available. So going on from Tolkien and how 19th century and 20th century medievalism is influenced on him, moving back to medieval studies. So medieval studies is a discipline that comes together in the 19th century. It's something that becomes institutionalized in the 19th century. Um, and all, all the kind of disciplines that kind of constitute it, some of the big ones, and especially the ones that were relevant for Tolkien, history, philology, mythology, and archaeology. Um, Tolkien himself was a philologist. His thing was languages. This is what he loved to study. And even when he had free time, that this is what, what he did and what he studied. Um, in addition to being an English professor and teaching things like Beowulf and making his students read Beowulf, not to torture them, but because it's a good poem, um, he also wrote some criticism. One of his most famous essays is Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics very, very highly influential on medieval studies itself. Um, even if Tolkien had never read, written anything about Middle Earth, writing this one essay would have made him this important figure in medieval studies. But that is often overshadowed by the fact that we know him as an author. We know him as the, the guy who wrote The Lord of the Rings. And then we can finally get to the, his, the actual languages that he knew. So as a philologist, Tolkien was interested not in just learning languages, but in, in studying their structure and in, stu in studying their history. So not just what language means or what words mean, but where did those words come from and how does language change over time? And as you can see, there's a very extensive list of languages of which he had a very, very good command. Even for a philologist, his command of different languages was considerable and actually quite, quite frightening. Um, he seemed part robot to me when I look at this list. Um, in addition to his philological work, he actually introduced the concept of what he calls the secondary world. He has an essay called On Fairy Stories, where he writes about the fantasy other world as a thing. So you kind of see amongst his work where he's talking about Beowulf, he's, he's working on languages, he's teaching you know, Anglo-Saxon, um, and then he comes up with this essay where he's talking about fantasy. And he, he gives it as a talk. Like he goes to a talk, or he gives to give a talk, like I am right now, in front of other academics, and he talks about fairy stories. So he kind of makes it a thing. Like that's a very, very brave thing to do, to try to take this, what is considered a somewhat non-academic topic and bring it to an academic audience, and he does. So while all this is going on, this is what Token writes about his fiction, and this is a, let, this is a 1955 letter. So this is a, in a letter that he wrote just after the publication of the last book of the Lord of the Rings, where he's suddenly becoming popular. And he, as a, as a professor of English, talks about how the authorities of the university might well consider an aberration of an elderly professor of philology to write and publish fairy stories and romances and call it a hobby pardonable because it has been surprising to me as anyone successful. All right, that's all good. We, he's talking about, you know, maybe I shouldn't be writing this stuff, or it's odd that I should be writing this stuff, but this is where we get to the kicker. It is not a hobby in the sense of something quite different from one's work taken up as a relief outlet. The invention of the languages is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the languages rather than the reverse. To me, a name comes first and the story follows. So Token was not writing stories on the side of his philological work. It wasn't like he went home and was like, I need to get away from that. Um, he was writing stories to provide a setting for the languages that he made up 
after he went home from his day job. So he loved philology so much that he just kind of kept going with it. Uh, so very, very much The Lord of the Rings is a side project not only to his, his life as a university professor, but also it's a side project to the, the languages that he invented with that. Now depending on how you define language, um, you can actually say, you can argue that he invented 10 languages, 8 languages, 12 languages for Middle Earth, which is you know, the, the world that he created. And notably for the ones that are most developed, he actually gives them a history. So he doesn't just write the languages, but he gives them a history with uh, vowel shifts, um, just like you would see in a real and living language. Quenya and Sindarin are his probably most developed languages, the ones that he loved the most, and he gives them to the elves. Um, and we know that he was working on these languages as early as World War I, and Tolkien was called up for World War I in 1916. So he's 24 years old. He's very, very, very young. Um, and if you recall the publication dates that I gave you earlier, The Hobbit did not come out until 1937. So The Hobbit, which people often associate as Tolkien's like first foray into Tinnable Middle Earth, um, that comes along, what, 20 years later? After he starts working on the languages for this world that he's kind of creating. Um, so this was it definitely, to my mind, a side project, but as I, th I think Adam had, he, he was uh, kind of calling me out at dinner the other night. He's like, but he worked on it for years and years. And I was like, no, it was more like decades and decades. Um, creating languages and then kind of putting these stories around them. Now, in addition to creating languages, he actually imports some languages as well. Um, and what you see there, you have Bilbo writing in this book. Um, Tolkien actually kind of creates this narrative convention, the Red Book of Westmark. If you actually read the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, he posits the entire Lord of the Rings as something that he found um, in these different kind of strange languages and that he translated, right? So he has this convention of the found text that he translates and the languages he conveniently chooses is for the common tongue, for Westron, modern English, right? For a people of Middle Earth that is, are, he wants to kind of portray as slightly uh, less advanced, such as the Rohirrim, he picks Old English. So the relationship between the Rohirrim and, say, the people of Gondor, um, he represents that linguistically with modern English, mostly so that you can understand what you know, he's saying, um, and Old English, which I think is kind of quite brilliant and, and made me very much like, kind of appreciate like, his work. <coughs> So going back to my initial question, Middle Earth, is it you know, homebrew of the century? It is definitely, to my mind, um, and, and some of you may disagree with me, would not have happened had Tolkien not come out of this tradition of like, medieval studies that really privileges philology, that privileges this art of languages and the history of languages and the idea that you can un uncover the past through language. Um, it would not have existed without an entire medieval revival behind it um, to kind of introduce him to these things as well. But almost kind of more importantly, what would we not have had Tolkien not turn this side project of his into an entire secondary world? Well, probably not extensive secondary worlds. This is Westeros for those of you who don't recognize that by sight. Probably no professional fantasy authors. Like, at all. So George R. R. Martin, who is often heralded as the next token, and I will call him that when he finishes. <laughs> right? <laughs> he can be the next token when he finishes his story. And no Dungeons and Dragons. No Magic the Gathering, which incidentally was created as a, something to play in between Dungeons and Dragons games at tournaments. So another <laughs> side project. No World of Warcraft, um, no Lord of the Rings franchises, no catchphrases, like it comes in pints. <laughs> Cheers.